Hello and welcome to your go-to Detroit Pistons podcast, The Pistons Pulse, co-hosted by me, Bryce Simon of Motor City Hoops, a former D1 Hooper and current teacher, husband, and father of three amazing kids. And I'm Omari Sanko for the second Pistons beat writer for the Detroit Free Press. And of course, we're always joined by our man, Wes Davenport. And at the end of this recording, if you guys haven't had enough Pistons trade deadline talk, he's going live over on the pin down at DBB. So stay with those guys. I'm also going live with Sam Bassini on Game Theory talking the deadline as a whole. But honestly, Omari, the Pistons did enough for the NBA at large at this deadline with all of their trades. First off, are you okay? Like you've been flying, you've been traveling, you're on the West Coast. All of these moves are made. Uh, I know we were getting some shout outs in the comments before, Amari. People saying you crushed it today. How are you doing? Yeah, it's been a busy two days. I woke up around 8 a.m. yesterday in Detroit, got to the. Well, first, I'll just preface this by saying the NBA did everybody a disservice by scheduling a West Coast swing that starts with back to back games on the day before the deadline and the day of the deadline. As a reporter, that means either you have to travel. You have to fly out Tuesday to cover Sacramento and then fly out today, the day of the deadline, to cover Portland. Or you do what I did, which is I just flew to Portland yesterday and skipped Sacramento. And that meant I could just be at my hotel <laughs> today and not be traveling the day of the deadline. But that means you have to travel Wednesday and probably have some deals happen while you're in the air. So long story short, flight left at noon at a layover in Salt Lake City. Flight got delayed a little bit, so I was there for like two hours. Then I fly two hours here to Portland. Two trades take place at that span, and we will talk about those in addition to the trades today here pretty soon. Then, of course, they play Sacramento last night, so I have like an hour to buy some food before I have to watch that game on TV. So just long day. And then I wake up this morning, and I set my alarm knowing that I was probably going to have to wake up earlier because of a trade. And like within 20 minutes of me waking up, they made their first deal. So it's just been it's just been nonstop for like 36 hours, but we're here. And we have a lot to talk about because they were probably the most active team of the entire trade deadline. I mean, here's the thing. Lost in all of this is a big Pistons win last night yeah. over the Sacramento <laughs> Kings. Like, right. It kind of sucks that Jay Nivey's not getting his flowers and Marcus Sasser and Jalen Dern and all these guys who played so well in a nice win for Detroit. I did drop my raw notes over at the Substack if you guys want to check that out. But let's get into this because we're going to go about 45 minutes today. Amari has a game to cover tonight. We have other things going on. So Amari, the, the best way I can do this is in chronological order. The only way I can keep track of what the Pistons have done so far is just going in chronological order. So let's start yesterday. We'll go trade by trade. And then the end, we can kind of recap it. Also, guys, we're coming back Sunday morning, and I'm sure the majority of that episode will be continuing to break this stuff down. So we'll be back Sunday morning, way before the Super Bowl starts, if anybody's watching and all of that. So Sunday morning, yes, Amari has killed it today, Chuck Brewer. Appreciate that. Uh, appreciate it. Guys, here's the other thing. We're over 200 live viewers right now. We, we get juiced about 100 on normal recording, so thank you to everybody tuning in live. YouTube, Twitter, hit like, subscribe, all of that stuff to keep this thing growing and staying with us in the future. And of course, if you're listening later on podcasts, thank you. All right, Amari, first trade, Simone Fontecchio goes to the Pistons in exchange for Kevin Knox, the rights to Gabriel Prashida, and this year's 2024 second round pick, which is the better pick of, I believe, the Wizards or the Grizzlies. Essentially, it's a very high second round pick. It's not the Pistons' own, but it's a very high second round pick. Initial thoughts on that trade that happened yesterday? Yeah, so of all the deals they made, that's probably the trade that was like the biggest pure win, just kind of judging by the reactions on social media. And then also just from a value standpoint, you get a guy, Simone Fontecchio, who at 6'7", really addresses two, their two biggest needs on the wing, which is shooting and defense. He's a 39% three-point shooter this season. Like, he really competes defensively. He's a really strong offensive rebounder. And he's the type of guy you can plug into any lineup, really, and he could probably hold his own. I know people were comparing him to Kevin Knox a bit, but he's a much stronger rebounder and a much stronger defender as well as is shooting the ball better this season. So I think all around, that that's just a really good piece for them. They gave him a really good second-round pick. Like, that's probably going to be a top two or three second rounder this year, which in this draft is probably pretty open after like 15, 16. So we could get a pretty good player there, but Fontecchio is going to be a restricted free agent this off season. And uh, everything I've heard suggests that he's a guy that they want to 
uh, keep long term. So that means that they can match any deals for him. Of course, I know there's, there's been some fretting in the fan base about what he's going to be paid, but I told somebody yesterday this, and I still feel that way. If he gets like a Marvin Bagley type deal, three years, 37.5, that's actually really good value for him just because of his skill set. And he was a guy that contending teams are reaching out about. So, yeah, I mean, he just makes a lot, a lot of sense for his team. I, I feel like we've talked about Fartecchio on, on the air, Bryce. Just what, what are your initial thoughts on that deal? Yeah, I liked it. I mean, I think it was a name I had brought up. If not on this podcast, I knew I had with Sam. I thought contenders should going after him because you knew Utah was going to sell at least a little bit. And he can really, every time I watch Utah play, man, I was like, he spaces the floor. I was telling Wes, he is very engaged defensively. He has good size. And at the end of the day, and, and we'll talk about this with Quentin Grimes, he's a guy who I think can take primary wing matchups. Now, is he going to lock down? Probably not. But at least he can take those matchups so other guys don't have to. And so I really like this. I, I text you this, I think, Omari. It does come down to the contract a little bit, right? Like, how much do you have to pay this guy? He is 28 years old, but we've been begging for wings. We've been begging for forwards. We've been begging for 3 and D, right? Guys that can space the floor but also can defend a little bit. And this guy does that. I don't, I didn't love the value of the second round pick. I know a lot of people like were going crazy about Prashida. Like, I guess maybe I haven't followed him enough to get upset about that. To me, this was essentially a second round pick, number 33, 34 for Fontecchio. I think that's fine, especially for the Pistons, who how many more young guys can you bring in, Omari, whenever you're already giving all of these guys minutes? So you're going to have a top five pick. Can you also find minutes for pick number 32? So I think the only complaint Omari is Maybe that pick could have got more value in return. But at the end of the day, this is the archetype of player this team needs. He's older. He has a track record before he came into the NBA. This is his second year in the NBA of shooting the ball well over his last two or three years. When I looked up his stats on Real GM, I think it was a nice move. No doubt. Uh, I mean, I think you summed it up pretty well. You're getting a guy who can come in and you know exactly what he's going to give you right now. It's not somebody that you're hoping develops into a guy like Fontecchio in two or three seasons. And especially, I think, with a pick early in the second round, you know, it can become somebody, but it could also, you know, not fan out at all. And you look back and you're like, I wish we had just put and got somebody Fontecchio. So that's really just quite a different deal for this team, just in the sense that they had largely prioritized making those swings on like unproven guys uh, around this time of year. We look at Bagley and you look at James Wiseman and their first move of the week this time was just, let's just straight up go and get a guy that we know is going to come in and help us immediately. And he and Quentin Grimes really are, I think the two players that are most significant in these series of deals for Detroit. I know we'll talk about Quentin Grimes here at Sicilian, but yeah, Fontecchio, I think all around is a move that most people would agree is going to help to say. And guys, I think what we'll do is maybe like at the end of the episode, we get to the last 15 minutes, we'll try to just rapid fire a lot of these questions you guys are asking. So Wes is going to go back and try to backlog a lot of what you guys are asking right now because there there have been some good questions. Richard, you ask about the cap space this offseason and some things like that. So get your questions in. We're not ignoring you guys. We will get to those. But I kind of want to get through all of these trades first. So let's move on to the next one because eventually we'll look at this stuff in totality. So the next one that happened was Troy Brown Jr., Shake Milton, and a 2030 second round pick from the Timberwolves for Monte Morris. So this happened yesterday as well. Amari, we went back and forth. Should we record last night or not? We thought about it and then we decided to wait till today. Let's just judge this initially or talk about this on that trade, just, you know, Monte Morris for Milton, Troy Brown, and that 2030 second round pick. What were your thoughts on that trade whenever you saw it? Yeah, I mean, I think in the grand scheme, like it's not like an earth shattering trade, right? You turn Monte Morris, who only played six games here just because of the injuries. And in those six games, it looked like he was still getting into game shape. So he wasn't really able to make the impact that I think he and the Fences expected this season. But you flipped him to Minnesota, a contending team where he'll be able to kind of slot in and really fit in there as a backup point guard. And then Troy Brown Jr. is a 3 and D wing. He and Shake Bill and who they also got are both one not guaranteed deals. So essentially expirings, but conceivably if Brown or Milton really <laughs> play, play well, then maybe that changes Detroit's thinking long term. And the 2032nd rounder, which, I mean, that, that kid's probably 12 years old right now, but 
But the main thing there is that you just got some sort of asset from Monte and you also recouped the second you gave up for him last year. So I think in the grand scheme, like that's just getting an asset for a guy who wasn't going to stick around block term. You have Marcus Sasser, Cade, Ivy, who are all on ball guys. And I think with that, it's just pretty clear that that's probably your, your future backcourt rotation. And you probably add maybe one more piece in there just for some more experience. But this season, being able to get that second round pick and you add a guy in Troy Brown Jr. who's shooting about 36% from three this year, but solid defender. He's another guy, uh, kind of like Fontecchio, who could come in and even if he doesn't return next year, he can still give me some depth there this season, which they need. Yeah, I mean, I think initially I was like, man, that doesn't seem like much for Monte Morris. And then I went back and looked at what the Pistons gave up for him, and it was just a 2027 second round pick. And so it's hard to say, you know, that Weaver should have gotten more for Monte Morris. He's you know, coming off an injury where teams have only seen him play for a handful of games, you get a 20, 30 second round pick. I realize that's later. Like I could understand fans who, you know, don't value it at the same, you know, level. I, I get that. But you do get two guys who, you know, I saw a tweet that said, I love this for Minnesota. You take two fringe rotation players in Shake Milton and Troy Brown, a second round pick, and you get, you know, one of the better backup point guards in the league. And yeah, like maybe Minnesota, quote unquote, won the trade because they got the better player. But if those guys are fringe rotation players for a championship contending Timberwolves team, then you put them on the six, now seven win Pistons. And it's like, okay, those guys make sense in the rotation. And again, they fill spots that this team just didn't have. I mean, you know, right, right or wrong. And obviously it was wrong that they needed guys like this. But, you know, if Troy Brown is coming off the bench at the three at 36 percent from three or I think roughly around there for his career and can play some solid defense on essentially an expiring contract, I don't hate that. So I I don't I I didn't, you know, get all excited about it or anything like this. I, I mean, you could say trading for Monte Morris didn't yield what you wanted, Omari, but I think that had more to do with the fact he was injured more than what you gave up for him or what you eventually got in return for him. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a market for Monte Morris, but, you know, especially just given that he's been injured most of the year, you're trading him based off of his track record more so than what he's done this season, which bumps the price down a bit. And I also just think long term, like they they probably weren't going to be like a re-signing over the offseason or whatnot. It's just like it's tough for Monte just in the sense that he's a Flint native and uh, came in really excited to play for the team he grew up watching and then injuries kind of robbed him of that, but. They traded all their vests to contending teams. You have Bobby and Burks that went to New York, and then Monte went to to Minnesota, and those teams are trying to make deep playoff runs. So uh, I guess for them, in the end, they ended up in pretty good situations. All right, let's talk about one more, and then we'll get to the big trade right after we take a break. So in a salary dunk for the Sixers, they get a you know, 31 through 55, 2028 20, second round pick. One of those second round picks, the Pistons get Daniel House, who they eventually would waive. We'll talk about all the guys that got waived in just a second, some cash, and then they got a 2024 20, second round pick. So for anybody, you know, worried, you know, if you want to look at it, they traded back 20 spots in the second round to essentially bring in Simone Fontecchio. If you want to look at those two trades, like I know we always like to look at things in totality. They traded out pick 32 or 33. They brought in pick 50 and they brought in Simone Fontecchio into a a trade exception. So I I don't know that that one really moves the needle, but I know fans get really nervous about all these second round picks flying around and they do get one back in this trade. No doubt. I think a lot of the moves that have been made under Troy Weaver are like in totality. Like it all makes sense, but the process to get there is always maybe a bit convoluted. But that's my takeaway from it as well. Uh, you're moving back in a second round that in a draft that's not really that strong to begin with. And the price for that is that you get a bona fide 3 and D wing uh, who can start some games for you, who can come off of the bench. And there's a player that you could keep around long term and is going to be a fit regardless of what direction you go to it. So I think the immediate value, of course, exceeds whatever value they would have gotten for the pick, even if it was 32, right? And then second round picks, I mean, I think we've, we've seen pretty thoroughly, especially with this regime, that they're, they're, they're pretty, I mean, you can get them and send them out pretty easily. So in the grand scheme, if the Pistons want to move back up in that draft, they could probably find a way to do so. All right, let's go to a short break, Amari. When we come back, we'll lead off with the, the big trade, right? The last one of the day, but the one that really had the biggest names and is probably going to be the most talked about and maybe scrutinized by the fan base.
All right. We are back with segment two. And we're going to talk about the big one, of course, Boyan Bogdanovic and Alec Burks being traded to the New York Knicks. Really, the the key pieces in that trade are Quentin Grimes and then the Knicks' own 2028 and 2029 second round picks. But along with that, you also got Evan Fournier. You got where did they see my minus Malachi Flynn? Whatnot. You leave Malachi out my guy Malachi Flynn. Flynn. Malachi and- Flynn, of course, and Ryan. I don't even Ar- know Archie I'm Diacono. Ar- Archie Diacono. There we go. But really, for that trade, the assets for the Pistons are those second round picks and Quentin Grimes. Bryce, what was your initial read on that trade? Because that's the one that's probably the most controversial, especially considering some of the rumors that have flown around Burks and Bobby in the past as far as their value. Yeah. So, you know, up to this point, I was like, okay, I, I can get behind all of these. You know, this stuff makes sense. And then initially that came out as Burks for Grimes in two seconds. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like Weaver, Weaver crushed this one. This, this, this is insane. Like I would take Burks for Grimes straight up, you know, considering Burks is expiring and, you know, Grimes isn't even on the last year of his rookie deal and all of those type of things. And then my mind went to, there's no way this is it. And I go, man, like. Just not be Boyan. Just don't be Boyan. Or if it is Boyan, let there be something else. So this was probably the one where I didn't love the value of these trades at the deadline. I and, and listen, I, I see people saying in the chat. At the end of the day, the you know if if there was a first round pick on the table, my guess is you you trade him for a first round pick. I feel like this screams, and you tell me what you think, Amari. I feel like this scream. This this front office really believes in Quentin Grimes. And I want to believe in Quentin Grimes because I think he fits what this team needs. Like we talked about, he's theoretical, you know, not even theoretical. He can shoot the ball and he can really defend. And I think he can really defend. Yet again, a guy that can really take those tough matchups. He fell out of favor in New York for whatever reason. But I feel like this is the front office saying we really believe in Quentin Grimes. My hesitation is, and he's not on the same level as these guys, but it does go back to what you said earlier when we said, well, if Marvin Bagley really turns into something, this trade makes sense. If James Wiseman really turns into something, this trade makes sense. And I just, I'm now I'm hesitant to go. If Quentin Grimes really turns into a 3 and D guard wing for this team, this trade really makes sense. But that's really what it comes down to is, hey, he fell out of favor in New York, but this guy can really be a good, at least rotation, if not starting 3 and D type of player. No, I think that's basically it. Grimes is a guy who's shown they can do both of those. He's been a defensive plus. Those especially, he's a third-year guy now, but as a rookie in, in this season, he's been a difference maker whenever he's on the floor defensively. And then he shot the ball pretty well for his career, too, around 38%. And he has a track record of doing both of those things since college. And it's kind of funny. I actually talked to Houston head coach Kelvin Sampson for a story of Marcus Sasser last summer. And he was just talking about how Sasser was probably the only guy who outworked Quentin Grimes during his entire time as head coach and out of Pistons out uh, both of those guys. So, you know, I think just from a culture standpoint, it makes sense. But beyond that, yeah, I mean, you have to know in the head, he's another 3 and D wing with a team that just really needs 3 and D guys. He's extension eligible this offseason, meaning that the Pistons could lock him and Simone, Simone Fontecchio into longer term deals this summer. But if not for Grimes and they get another year to evaluate them, and then they can also tie him up in 2025 as well and just match an offer there. So just another guy who fits what they're looking for a long term. Another Drandy wing on a team that entered the season really with none at all. And, you know, I think the main maybe sore point for a lot of fans who have been following this whole saga with Bogey and Burtz is just that the Knicks own the Pistons first round pick. Yep. Yep. And there's been so much talk some of theorizing fake trades just about how the Pistons get that pick back. And Detroit's best trade chip to get that pick back was Boyan Bogdanovic. And, you know, they cashed him and Bergson essentially just to get Quentin Grimes in a couple seconds, which, you know, is probably disappointing for people who have really been fixated on that pick. But I always got the sense that it would be Grimes or the pick, not both. And I think ultimately to get a player who has proven he can do the things that you need from the wing. There is value in that. But yeah, overall, like those were probably your your two best veterans and you turn them essentially into one player, which maybe in the grand scheme, there's some disappointment there. But I don't see it as like a net negative trade by any means just because Burks is 32, Brown is 34, and now they're those same 
neither of those guys really played a lot, lot of defense as, as much as they added offensively. And I'm thinking the grass game makes sense, even if it's probably not as big a return that a lot of people wanted. Travis says, Killian doesn't eat peanut butter and Lay's sandwiches. That's why he got cut. See, uh, Travis, <laughs> Travis, that means I get cut from the fan base as well because yeah. I I don't eat those either. I, I eat Uncrustables for lunch every day when my students don't steal them from me. So, And I definitely am not putting any chips on them. I do want to just say our guy, Keith Smith, friend of the pod, he said this most likely will end up being Flynn for Burks and then Boyan for everything else. He thought, essentially, when it came out, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I saw this tweet, and then that would create some trade exceptions on both sides. So if you guys see that in the next coming days, that maybe it's like, this is how it actually went through, that would be right. So maybe, and we just saw what the Pistons did with one of those trade exceptions, acquiring that second round pick for Daniel House, where those can come into play. And then a couple other, like, let's get to this. So they waived Joe Harris, they waived Daniel House Jr., Archie Diakono, I want to say they didn't waive the guy for Fournier because he has a team option. So I don't think whenever there's an option at the end, if you waive that player, I think that option kicks in automatically. So I think that's why he needed to stay on the books. Plus, you could potentially exercise that option and use him as matching salary in the offseason. And then the big one, Amari, let's go ahead and get to this, Killian Hayes. Killian Hayes gets waived. We talked about this on the last episode that, you know, potential trade, stuff like that, but it didn't seem like he was going to be here post-deadline. This doesn't look good for Troy Weaver's first draft, which was Killian Hayes, who you waived before his rookie deal is over. You traded Sadiq Bey for James Wiseman, who can't get off the bench recently. Isaiah Stewart, I think, is a fine player, but, you know, I think is a third big. But, you know, for Killian Hayes, this doesn't look good for Troy Weaver selecting him or for, you know, Hayes. But maybe now he goes and finds a home. He gets to choose his home. And maybe he's really able to, to find his footing in the NBA. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously not how you want the situation with your first, the first pick of your 10 year to go. But, I mean, we talked about it on the pod Sunday. And then I also wrote it over the weekend that both sides are just ready to move on. Killian's cap, I mean, they see the writing on the wall. You have Ivy, you have Sasser, you have Cade. So... What role is there going to be for Killian beyond this season? And even then, he had picked up three DMPs until last night when the bits we had to play him because they had just traded Monte Morris. So, and Kate was also up, of course. So, yeah, I mean, to, to wave him, I think that was the question. And we had even that text about it, right? Like, if they don't find a trade, do they, do they just release or wave him at that point? And that's exactly what happened. So, it's, I mean, I think the writing was on the wall even last summer when the Pistons, when they got Monte and Marcus Sasser and Part of the reason why I stuck around is just because T. Williams wanted a chance to to work with him, but that were halfway past the season and that kind of worked itself out naturally. Like you said, Killian would be able to figure out what team fits him best. I know a lot of people have sort of theorized that the Spurs will make sense just given their lack of playmaking and they don't need somebody who can really deliver lobs to help Wimby and like we know Killian can do that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's just a, a tough way for his tenure with the Pistons to end, but Overall, he, he's played well for stretches, and the main thing for him is just tying it together and like really locking in on defense, really being able to add something on offense, which has always been the question, right? We've we've seen guys like Chris Dunn, like Dennis Smith, showing yeah. those guys were lottery picks, and it took them a bit to figure it out, but they have figured it out. So I still think there's a pathway there for Killian, even, even if it takes them a bit to figure it out. Chuck asked an interesting question about this. Was this a favor to Hayes waving him so he can get a new start? If he hadn't asked to be moved, would he still be on the team? This is kind of what you and I were texting back and forth about Omari. That's an interesting dynamic, Chuck, because, yeah, I'm sure Killian wanted a new home, but it also isn't a great look on Killian to be waived before your rookie contract is even over. So I'm sure that was a conversation him and his agent representation had on, you know, what do we want this to look like? And then ultimately, like, who knows? Like, at one point, we all knew today the Pistons had 19 guys on their roster. And again, Fournier, I don't believe, I could be wrong here. It may not work with the team option. I know it does with the player option. I don't think Fournier was an option to be waived. And so it may have come down to, like, he just was the guy they felt most comfortable waving, wasn't in the rotation, all of that. One other thing here, Amari, I was talking to somebody about future. You must have had a tweet about setting up for the summer and a big move and stuff like that. So let's touch on that real quick. And I just want to say, I understand wanting to get that first round pick back from the Knicks. It definitely opens up flexibility. But with each passing year, that becomes a little bit less of an issue. So for example, 
if the Pistons waited till after they made their 2024 first round pick, they could trade that player after they make the selection. They could trade that player and then they could also trade, I believe, 2029 and 2031. So essentially, you could have three first round picks in that deal. So I just wanted to put that out there that those protections go to 2027. And as these further out years start to become available to trade, it does open up the potential first round assets to go make a big move if that's what's necessary. I just wanted to throw that out there because it seemed like maybe you got some pushback on their ability and flexibility to make a big move this offseason. Is that right? Yeah, it's just, you know, I think people at this point are just skeptical that they're ever going to do it just because they've had cap space so many years in a row. But I mean, really for next season, yes, yeah, only Simone and Grimes who are on the books and you have a couple of guys who can still pick up for whatever reason, but they still have the majority of that cap space that they cleared earlier this year available, right? And back then the word was that they want to add two significant solids. So I think that's still the plan. And of course they have to do it now, right? Like you're on pace for 11 wins this season. So you've got to cash out money in and really up the talent floor for the same. So those were the goals, I think, for this deadline were just to get a couple of 3 and D wings and just use whatever, you know, trade chips you have to get that done. And along with that, you also got some second round picks, but then you also preserve that flexibility going forward. So if these weren't the earth shattering shades that are going to permanently change things for the better, but I think it's just more table setting trades that improves the team now, as well as preserves the tools over the summer for them to make even bigger moves. Chuck asked, it converts to a second at some point, right? Like, yeah, this stuff is over in 2027. So it's protected top nine in 2027. If it doesn't convey, convey, excuse me, then it turns into a second in 2027. So again, like then they would be able to trade 2029, 2031 this off season. And then there's also pick swaps available and all of that to, you know, get around the stepping rule. So my overall point here is they are starting to get access to some of these picks and uh, ability to make moves. I've said it all along. This, this front office has put themselves in a situation where you can build this out, but it's a very thin line. There's not much you know, margin for error. They're going to have to thread the needle. And when they go after that big move, they are going to have to hit on it. And that's just the situation they put themselves in with the lack of draft capital and all of that. The, the exciting thing is like, you do have some young players though, Cade and Ivy. And I think my biggest takeaway as we sit here right now, kind of this instant reaction, and Amari, we'll get a chance to digest this over a couple of days. And maybe by Sunday, we have a different vibe. I feel like we've seen this front office learn from the mistakes of last offseason where they didn't bring any wings or forwards. They didn't bring in any floor spacing. They didn't have any 3 and D guys that could do both. And I feel like we've seen them prioritize some bigs who could space the floor, Mascala and Gallo. They bring in Fontecchio, Grimes, even Troy Brown Jr. At least some guys, even if they're not all those guys are here long term, they do some things that maybe, hey, now we find out how good is Cade Cunningham. No more excuses about floor spacing, Omari. No more excuses about defense with Jalen Duran because you have other guys around him that can defend. And now we can really find out how good these guys are and, and if they can grow. And that at least is positive for me. No doubt. And like overall, it really is, I think, just a table setting type of trade, right? We addressed the needs. We brought in two bigs to space the floor. We have two wings to space the floor. Three, including Troy Brow and... They're shifting gears where the previous strategy, I think, really relied on hope for guys to develop skills that they hadn't shown, right? You don't get a rim protector last season because you're putting faith that Isaiah Stewart and Darren and Wise and or Bagley will make a leap there and they had it. And you expect some of your guys internally to, to be able to beat those 3ND guys and they didn't pan out. So they're going out and getting players who have already proven to do it rather than sort of putting some hope in the players who have not yet. And along with that, there was just some bad luck with the Hall last uh, summer. Like, of course, Joe Harris was not in the position, I think, physically to be the difference maker they needed him to be. And then Monte Morris just coming in and getting hurt, something that you can't quite plan for. Uh, so this, you know, like I don't want to say this rectifies last offseason, but I would say that I think that they're, it, it reflects their awareness that they need to just get bonafide players in and not necessarily rely on internal development and maybe a, a bit of luck for things to pan out. Okay, before we go to break, I just want to give the total kind of haul from, from all of these trades, going back to the Marvin Bagley, Isaiah Livers. So the Pistons net one second round pick in totality, 
And then, of course, you get what seems to be future players in at least Grimes and Fontecchio. You know, who knows if any of the other guys end up sticking. And then you took on no bad long-term money. All the expiring, all the cap space, all of that is still there. So that just is kind of totality. You sent out Monte Morris, I think true pieces, Monte Morris, Boyan, Alec Burks, obviously, depending on how you feel about Bagley and some other guys as well. So if you kind of want some totality, I think that kind of encompasses all of those things. And then you can make a judge on how you feel about the deadline in general, where this team is at. We got some questions we got to get to Amari. So we're going to go a short break. When we come back, let's start off with Jeremy Goldberg. He asked about starting lineup between Quentin Grimes, Fontecchio, et cetera. All right, we are back with segment three, and we're going to dive into some depth chart stuff. So who starts, Grimes or Fontecchio? I did do a very brief depth chart while I was writing my Detroit Dillon recap story, which everybody should read once it goes live today. And basically, I kind of loosely outlined, well, I actually added up, but I closed it down, so let me pull it back up. Long story short, I think Fontecchio starts, and okay, just... Positionally, I think he's probably the most likely player who could fill the holes you have at the three. I think he makes sense from that standpoint. And I have it up here, actually. So I had at the one, you have Cade Cunningham, uh, Shake Milton, and Malachi Flynn. At the two, you have Jaden Ivey, Sasser, and then Quentin Grimes. And then you have Fontecchio, Brown, and Fournier at the three. Uh, Isaiah Stewart, Asar Thompson, Mike Muscala at the four. At the four, and then Duran, Wiseman, Yalinari at the five. So, assuming Stewart and Duran are the starting front court, I think you just slot Fontecchio in there at the three, and then you could play whoever else there and probably feel pretty good. I mean, my thing with this is like I, I'm I'm kind of done with the Stewart starting at the four stuff, and so I would rather see something else here. I mean, I know it'd be a little bit small with Grimes and Fontecchio in the starting lineup, but that really gives some floor spacing to Cade and J.I. and two guys that can take, you know, defensive matchups off their play. If it needs to be something else, I get it. But I, I kind of like the idea of that, I think, because I still like the idea of Asar and Stu in the second unit. And we've seen... Asar, pretty. I mean, I guess it could be Asar and Gallo or Asar and Mascala. I just think we've seen him play pretty well with a, you know, a stretch big where he can be the pick and roll and dunker spot, kind of do all the quote unquote big guy things, especially on the offensive end. But at the end of the day, Omari, what I really want to see, like, there are some intriguing, you know, rotations where you can get Grimes and Sasser and Asar all on the floor together potentially. There's enough sports floor spacing, and you can really defend the heck out of people. So I think they can do some interesting things now. I'm fascinated to see what they end up doing with the starting lineup. Big Chi says, also, do these trades mean that we see more lineups with Sar at the four rather than the three? So what do you think this means for a Sar playing the three position when you add in a Grimes, a Fontecchio, and even a Troy Brown Jr.? I think we will continue to, continue to see a Sar at the four a lot, but I think with how much spacing they have, I think it makes the three or four distinction a little less meaningful than it was before, right? Because you could put, if you put Fontecchio and Asar next to each other, like who's the three and who's the four there, right? Like both those guys can defend, they can both rebound, and Fontecchio can shoot. So, of course, that still frees Asar to work the ducker spot, especially if you have Stu at the five, right? Like you still have Asar doing maybe more of those quote unquote big man things. So, you know, it's kind of hard for me to imagine it in like a positional sense, but I think it is a lot easier to not put a SAR in the quarter and hot, right? Like he can work the baseline, he can send a ducker spot, he can do maybe more of the traditional power forward big things on offense while also running the break and rebounding and everything else he provides, right? They've been running where pick and rolls with him. I think you can still do all of those things and it makes it a bit easier not to shoot at it more shooting around that. So Aruna says, pretty sure Knox made history. Has anyone else been traded from the same team two trade deadlines in a row. I'm not the history guy here. Well, this is probably yeah. the spot to give a shout out to Keith Black Trudeau, maybe even Keith Smith. Hit those guys up on Twitter. Those are the guys that are going to have the answers. Mari, I definitely, I'm not the guy for this question, but it, it is kind of interesting. Like if, even if he's not, it can't be that many people that have done it. So it's a very interesting little, you know, quirk here that 
Knox got traded, didn't even start the season with the Pistons, got added to the roster and then got traded again. So good catch on that Aruna wasn't something I was really thinking about in the midst of the chaos. Yeah, that is a great question. And I wish I knew the answer to it. I would imagine the list is probably pretty small. Yeah, I do think Seth Curry has been traded by Dallas a couple of times. I don't know if it was the same day. But was it back to back, back to back? Yeah, I mean, it was back to back. So somebody's going to find the answer to that. And I want it to be set. (laughs) Like what it is, because I'm extremely curious about that. I think that's interesting. All right. Chuck says, game was too late to watch last night. Asar is questionable. Did he get hurt last night? He rolled his ankle, Amari. He came back and played in that game. Uh, I don't know what else you have. I know your day's been filled with deadline news. So any I- anything there? No, I mean, that's pretty much it. He rolled his ankle. Uh, looked pretty bad. But then he came back in the second half and played so you know, of course, when you roll up an ankle, you can wake up the next day and then, it, you know, it hurts again. So he's questionable, but I think it's just a road ankle. So whether he's day to day or, or whatnot, I think we'll ask Monty today and get some more details. A uh, real quick question. Wes actually put this in the chat. Gallinari is listed as not with the team on the injury report. Is that potentially just a, you know, a misprint or any insight onto that that you're aware of at all? I don't have anything right now. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't traded, so it could just be a misprint. But I, I'm not sure why he's listed that way at this point. Okay. Uh, Sham says, did the Pistons get enough for Burks and Boyan? We kind of touched on this. Like, I would say for my appetite, no. Like, that's the trade that's the most uneasy for me. But again, I just feel like, and this is why I wonder if Grimes doesn't start, because I feel like they had to really value Quentin Grimes if you're going to give up Boyan and Burks and all, quote unquote, all you're getting back is some future second round picks, I feel like Grimes had to be really meaningful in that trade. And so for my appetite, no, like there's part of me and I would have to really think this out a little bit deeper, almost think I would rather have just kept one of them, maybe Boyan and just traded Burks for a couple seconds or whatever you could get. But my initial thought right now is probably at least not what I was hoping. I I thought the two first round thing, I don't even know, I don't even know how much I believe that was on the table at last year's deadline. I, I thought Boyan was gonna net a first though, Amari. Did you have that feeling or no? I always felt maybe at best the Fences will get a first for Boyan. I never thought it was a situation where they would ever get multiple for him. And I thought Burks might get you a second or somewhere in that range. So if you replace the first runner with Grimes, then I think that's probably closer to what was realistic, especially considering just they're, they're getting older, right? Like Burks is 32 and he's missing games from injury. A boy else had calf issues. He's 34, turning 35 this year. I think the hardest that they got was probably more on the side of what was always realistic rather than them maybe getting, say, a first round pick and Grimes, right? You know, I think being able to net Grimes and that changed the math for the business a bit. All right, Richard Brooks says, after all of this, what does the projected cap space look like for next year? I kind of just looked at it a little bit. It kind of depends on what site you look at. But uh, I mean, it's still 60 plus million. I mean, the, the all of the cap space is still going to be free. I did say so, see somebody ask about dead money. Yes, there is some like legit dead money on the cap right now because of Joe Harris and Killian Hayes and all that. But none of that carries over into the offseason. I believe maybe they have one more year of Dwayne Deadman's 2.5 or whatever it is, and then that's finally gone in terms of dead money. What's but, he up to? Can he play defense? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, everybody has pointed their attention to a rim protector now is what this team needs. And I just want to say, I, I want to save that conversation for Sunday because I think that's yeah. fascinating and also speaks a little bit more to what's currently on the roster. And the, the fact we're questioning that so much is just kind of telling to me. But essentially the cap space is still very open. They can create a bunch of it. So none of this did anything to hurt that. You'll you'll see like Troy Brown and Shake Milton, like it's 9 million between the two of them, both non-guaranteed. Again, why do I keep forgetting the guy from New York's name? Goodness gracious. Evan Fournier is a Fournier. team option. Yeah, like all of these guys, it, they can still clear all of that money, Amari. Yeah, exactly. The, they... The Grimes and you know, are the, the two guys who kind of eat into that a bit. But again, Grimes may still be on his rookie salary next season. So you're still looking at preserving pretty significant cap to go out and, and, and make something happen. Robbie Dennis says, what does our rotation look like now? We talked about that a little bit. Again, I think that's probably like Sunday's episode. We really dive into some of those things as we have a chance to really look at it. How many of the Knicks guys are expected to see minutes? Again, I think Quentin Grimes plays a lot. I don't think we see the, you know, a Fournier at all. Archie Diacono already got waived. 
I am still a Malachi Flynn guy. I think Malachi Flynn is good at basketball. I'm not saying he's a starter by any means, but I think this is a guy that can knock down shots. He really competes defensively. He navigates ball screens. Like, uh, I realize he's always just kind of considered a throw in in these moves, but I think Malachi Flynn is a good basketball player. So to have him in your guard rotation, I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I don't, with as good as Sasser has played though, I'm not sure the minutes come there, but I do like Malachi Flynn. So I would say Grimes for sure, Omari, right? Like you can't make that trade if you're not planning on playing Grimes. And then maybe Flynn, if they need some some depth in a guard rotation, depending on you know, nightly basis type stuff. Yeah, I would be surprised to see more than Grimes. He's just a guy that, you know, I think it's not only the highlight of the trade for the Pistons, but is also the guy who feels the biggest need. You know, maybe if there's injuries or a four year can really hit shots, we see bits of him. Maybe Flynn, you know, works himself into a, a, a backup role at point guard in, in some capacity, depending on Bounty's reliance on Ivy and Sasser to kind of finish up uh, those point guard minutes, which is CVD. But I think Grimes for sure is 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 the one who will play the most minutes of all those guys. All right. Doug McMinniman says, question, did Ivy win the trade deadline? So this is the one that's really interesting to me. Omari, the Pistons just traded out a lot of points and a lot of field goal attempts. And they didn't necessarily bring in guys that are high usage field goal attempts or scores, right? Like Fontecchio, we said, is a big time shooter, not necessarily a big time scorer. Same thing with Quentin Grimes, even Troy Brown, Shake Milton, any of these guys were talking, you know, they can space the floor. I think they defend. But to me, I think this does have to be the front office, hopefully Monte Williams as well, saying, Ivy, go do your thing. Cade, Ivy, probably Duran taking a little bit more offensive load. Those guys are really going to have to have it on the offensive end. And so I'm kind of about it as somebody who's been saying Jaden Ivey's good at basketball and we saw him cook on Wednesday night against the Kings. I kind of love it because, Omari, you do have floor spacing around them to give them that space to cook. Yeah, the Pistons moved the ball shockingly well last night. Like it was just like the the ball was flying, like finding open shooters. Ivey was attacking downhill. It, like it was just... That was probably their best played games of the season. Like shooters were, were knocking down threes. Everything you wanted to see them do was in that game. And Ivy was a big part of that. So as you mentioned, Bryce, they cleared out a lot of minutes, a lot of scoring with this trade. And Ivy coming off that 37 point performance. Even before that, he's been in a really efficient stretch in his career. Like I think earlier this week, I crossed the number. It says he was promoted into the starting lineup permanently a couple of months ago. And then that's bad. He's shooting like 46% overall, 37 from three. He's struggled at the line a bit, but he's gotten to the line at a high rate. Then his defense has improved. So this has been a, sort of a mini breakout season for him in a sense. And it does set the table for him that we're really strong finish to the year, just given that the ball is going to be in his hands a lot more, pretty much almost by default, you know, just given that they gave up Mount and Killian. All right. So Doug says, and we'll go through these last few here real quick. Do we know now to do anything with Gallo and Mascala? Like, I assume they stay on the roster for the rest of the season, Amari, and then either leave in free agency or if the front office finds some value in keeping at least one of them around as a a fifth, you know, big that spaces the floor, maybe. But I I don't see them getting bought out. Do you? Is that like, I feel like if they were going to, they that would have happened today as they were clearing roster spots. Yeah, my sense what they trained for them was that they would probably stick around the rest of the year. Just bringing in those two vets, I think, made them more comfortable parting ways with Bogey and Birch, just given that they don't want to have too young of a roster. And, I mean, what the Pistons are, what, four and seven sets that trade, and they both come in and play some really good minutes. So I would expect them to stick around. You know, maybe one of them decides that they want to get bought out and compete at some point. But right now, I've gotten a sense that they'll finish the season up. So Chris says the Sasser shot creation makes sense to pair him with the Sar and Stu off the bench. Let's save that one for Sunday. That's something I think we'll dive into as we really get into the rotations. Thank you for the question. Just elevated from Twitter. Now we know our roster to finish the season. What would you guess our record to be by the end of the year? Let's let us let, let us digest that one a little bit too. Let's save that one as well, Omari. But I wanted to give you guys a shout out because we do appreciate the questions. And before we answer this last one, again, guys, Thank you so much. We're up over like, we're right around 250 live viewers right now. This is double anything we've ever done. Very exciting, very energetic. And we appreciate you guys so much. Tune in every week. We do these live. So again, like to help us spread this, share, subscribe, all of that stuff. If you're listening on podcasts, leave a rating, review, all of those type of things. And then make sure you come back with us every week. Last one here, Amari, before we go, Stephen Pye says, is this team now a closer version to the quote-unquote defensive identity that Troy was talking about in the offseason? 
No doubt. I mean, just to add two guys in Fontecchio and Brown and also Grimes, like all those guys are, are 3 and D wings and uh, they should all be able to play minutes this season. Uh, it absolutely brings the Pistons closer. The big key in that is still getting a legitimate rim protector uh, who can be a difference maker in that capacity. But beyond that, uh, they're absolutely better along the perimeter. And I wouldn't be surprised if their defensive numbers over these last 32 games are uh, quite a bit better than their numbers over the first 50. And I think what's really good about this, Amari, is not only did he get better defensively, they did it without compromising floor spacing, or they should be able to, theoretically, with what they brought in. Now, overall scoring, guys, that's a fair question, right? Like, it can't just be Caden Ivy. So some of these guys will have to take some better usage and more usage and all of that. But the floor spacing didn't just completely go away with these moves. Guys, we have a lot more to dig into and dive in and talk about, but Omari has a game to cover tonight. Omari, you crushed it today. You are the man. The best beat writer in the business resides in Detroit. So six wins, seven wins, doesn't matter. Our man Omari Sankopa the second holding it down. Wes keeping everything flowing behind the scenes. And we have the best listenership, viewership. We appreciate you guys so much. Thanks for coming in. There, there she is, Cheryl Brown. Very exciting. Great job, guys. Always love whenever she joins in. Omari, take it away, my guy. Appreciate the kind words. Thank you, Mom, for, for tuning in. <laughs> I will say this. Um, my mom gets bothered when I forget to tell her when we stream live. So like five minutes in, I was like, I've been, I've been so scrambled the last few days. I was, <laughs> forgot to text her recording. So got to keep up my parents on this one. And I'm happy to just turn my brain off for two hours before this face. This Blazers. Where, like, I was like, I don't even know what this is. You're in Portland. I'm, in, you're in Portland. I'm, I'm in Portland. I'm in, like, I was about to look all the Thursday, like, February like, 8th. You are in Portland, Oregon right now. Yeah. So, anyway, I need a break. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll talk to you all soon, and I will go ahead and close this out. So, big thanks, as all, to our editor in chief, Avery Nicole Mickles, our audio producer, Robin Chen, our executive producer, Arthur Delgado, and our sports editor, Kirkland Crawford. And then, as always, big shout out to Wes.